Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, worshippers of all ages, welcome to game one of the Verizon Warriors series. We're proud to be bringing you this match between Celts and IFHE. Celts spawning in green on the north end of the map, bringing Lexington Turpets, Baltimore, Belfast, Otago, and Ikizu uh, sorry, Akizuki, Ikizuki, listen to me already, and Orkan. <laughs> I know, right? From the south spawn, that would be IFHE. They are fielding Shokaku, North Carolina, fronted by double Amalfi Zap. Ooh. Oh, Japayev yeah. and I know, and double Akizuki. Interesting decision to run uh, double Akazuki there. I feel like uh, the green team has a slight advantage with that Orkan's radar capabilities. Uh, the the choice to go double Amalfi tells me that they are hoping that they can hunt and kill a, a destroyer early. And a Turpitz. Right. Indeed. Now, this might be one of the first times we've seen a Turpitz in Tier 8 competitive play. And, well, in a very long time, anyway. Mm -hmm. You and I used to see them way back in the day in Supremacy League, right? But in this kind of play, it's uh, I'm not sure we've seen one in a very long time. No, I am excited to see a Lexington, though. I Doing Supremacy League, I used to love and prefer Lexington over Shokaku back in the RTS days. Indeed. It's interesting that, that Kelts has opted for a triple radar lineup. That, I feel like that's absolutely going to give them uh, a bit of a leg up here. So it's going to be curious to see how IFHE decides they want to they wanna kind of, um, you know, set up and, and, and play out against, against this, uh, this, this, this much radar on the opposing team. Yeah. Meanwhile, Pikachu going in for an early torpedo strike on Involuntary Souls Lexington, making him feel less comfortable uh, being so far advanced as he dives farther south to the eye line, heading to J now. Indeed, a bit of a, a bit of a carrier snipe. There's even some more North Carolina shells continuing to fall in on Involuntary's position. Mm -hmm. Did he lead these right? Oh my goodness! He wow. did lead them right. Holy that, cow! Oh, that's a big what hit. A sh what a shot! 26 wow. kilometers and change, and Mr. Sox basically almost wipes out the opposing carrier. You know, we commented on this before during the training uh, session last weekend, but the, the Tier 8 ships, they, they don't behave like Tier 10s. You could get away they with don't. that positioning in a midway. You can't do that in a Lexington. <laughs> very not. Very not. Well done. A little yeah, bit of early drama there. at sea. A little bit of early drama at sea. Celts diving the Orkon in, bagging the cap. But the Chapai of double Akizuki smoke cloud on the south end of the cap, making life a bit miserable for Z's Orkon. <gasps> they got wow. it. Involuntary Soul goes down. First blood. It's only been three minutes into the game, Raptor. Three minutes in and the opposing carrier is off the board for IFHE, Zath. That is a huge kill. That is absolutely a huge kill. And IFHE, by the way, we didn't talk about this. Two destroyers, both of them south of Cap, and they're still unable to really do anything down there. They're on the back foot for a good part of this, but now that the carrier's been um, removed from their opponent, maybe they'll be a little emboldened. going to be curious to see how things unfold. I mean, you know, Celts here obviously with the cap advantage early, looking mm -hmm. like they've got a solid board position. The Baltimore, Orcon, and Bell, there's triple radar at sea, Zaf. Yes. So if, if you're IFHE, you basically have to be looking at redeploying your team. Seize the play, in my opinion. You've got to break in there somehow. Um, and I, and I honestly, if, you know, if I'm, if I'm Celts, I'm almost considering bringing the Turpets back, but they seem to have a different plan in mind. Yeah. Looking at that Turpets, uh, over by A, it looks like he's kind of fixing the head south and, uh, possibly push against two Amalfis and a North Carolina. Does Very indeed interesting. Look like does indeed look like they're going to drive Wolf Seekers Turpets down the four line and push the B cap here. Involuntary Souls, last last surviving squadron on the board, going in to soften up, try to soften up anyway. One of these one of these Amalfis that's already sitting yep. on the B cap. Uh, now that the, the uh, Chapayev, uh, eight point buck, two thousand six got uh, got torpedoed. I think that was an Orcon torpedo. Uh, so that's going to force him back a little bit. One thing I haven't really noticed much. You said that C is the is the play. It's going to be the focus. Um, but those Akizukis really aren't making their guns heard, and I don't know if it's a lack of spotting or just a lack of overall positioning to be able to get these uh, the, these guns into play, because Akizuki's great against cruisers if you can just 
pop them down there or just start, you know, pew pewing away. Now it's starting to happen here north of C. I was going to say, Bilsha's Baltimore kind of caught out here. He's a little too far away from the island cover that he, he really should be snuggled up more to, you know, probably his east, I suppose. They are yep. going to get him off the board here. Between the Chipaya, the Double Akizuki, the Shokaku Rockets, he's going to go out. Yeah, that's there a it huge is. Second, that's a huge second kill for IFAG playing from the south spawn here. I'm ugh, I'm not sure Kelts can pull this one out now, Zaf. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, it, it, it's it's a matter of time, quite frankly. Once that Lexington goes down, Kelts loses vision. Kelts loses the ability to focus on one area with, with follow-up strikes. Um, so, unfortunately, I think they were kind of in the wrong positioning at C cap, I think they need to be more in a kite away position instead of bow in. Wolverine now going to be coming under uh, sustained fire in the Belfast by the double Akazuki and Chapayev again. Indeed. Now, I will say, I think if you look at, at Kelts' board position, they've rotated the Orcon back down the six line. I It feels like, you know, they, they at one point the Orcon was kind of hanging out near the Baltimore. They pulled mm -hmm. him out, pushed him down the six line. I'm not sure I like that play. I feel like. If it were if if I was sitting on their shoulder, I probably would have tried to solidify the C position rather than go for this push with the turpits down the four line, which is kind of where they're at right now. Yeah, but I mean they did lose their carrier early, and that might signal that the need to be more aggressive and and try to make a play, uh, as opposed to the original plan of well we'll you know we'll let them come to us at C cap. And you, I think the Orcon oh. rotating gives them a chance to to maybe surprise the uh, North Carolina or something. Yep, big salvo from the North Carolina landing there on Wolf Seekers Turpits and Pikachu Shokaku coming in for the follow-up torpedo strike. If these torpedoes get led right, this is probably the end of this Turpits. And I think he's going to take wow. them both. Yep, yeah, he is. Yeah. It is. There's our death pick. <clears throat> Just like that, three ships upside down, losing control of the sea cap. Both their capital ships off the board. Kelts looks yep. like they're going to lose game one, Zaf. I just don't see how they can... I don't think they can find their way out of this. Nope. 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 I, I would completely agree with you. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, it's just a matter of time at this point. Four ships down now that Wolverine's Belfast 43 goes down. As you like to say, it's all over but the crying. Yeah. It, it feels like it really is. And, and you know, if you're if you're Kelts, I'm... I think, I, think, I think it all goes back to the carrier snipe. But at the same time, right? Like, we, you know... Carrier sniping is becoming more of a valid tactic in, in randoms, even. And so, in my mind, it you kind of have to come into a game like this expecting it, or at least allowing that your opponent might try it. If you spawn into the game in a carrier, especially something as, as, as fat and juicy as a Lexington, right, which doesn't handle that well and, and can obviously be citadeled by the opposing battleship, you know, turn your engines on, you know, don't sit still uh, in the early moments of a match, look around for a better position, maybe find some cover at a minimum get moving right um stay with your team a little while the extra AA help cover might help some that's certainly you know if, if nothing else even if you find a way to come back from that early carrier loss just the act of losing it is so demoralizing right as a team you're just like uh it just feels terrible absolutely absolutely and i mean it, it's a north being a, a smaller ish map it's a, a snipe is a possibility so that that yep. should serve as a wake-up call to uh, both teams about carrier positioning early on a little bit of Akizuki on Akizuki action over here at the sea cap. Orkan goes down. And uh, that, that'll Vipers pretty much cover it on that flank. <laughs> yeah, Vipers Akizuki will go down momentarily. And when that happens, that is essentially the game. Ten seconds on the timer. IFHE cleans things up nicely. They were gonna, they're going home with a win here in game one. Solid win for them. Very much so. I wonder... I wonder if their name is IFAG, if they took IFAG on all their ships, including their Amalfis. It feels like it's probably a waste on the Amalfis in North Carolina, but I'm just speculating. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well played to both teams, but already here, Zath, in Game 1, you see immediately right away the potential vulnerability of having an aircraft carrier on your team, and if you don't drive it or protect it correctly, how quickly it can go south on you. Absolutely right, and of course that was that was crucial. I mean, or, originally I think his positioning, I, I understood what he was trying to do: get closer to the action so his planes can be a, a bigger uh, influence on the battle. I, I think the big mistake that he made, though, as soon as he was getting uh, sniped by the carrier, was was that turn out back to north because uh, that just.
turned him nice and sideways for the yep. uh, for North Carolina shells. Indeed. Well, a convincing game one win here for IFHE. Let's send it back to the studio and uh, get ready for game two. Thank you, Sea Raptor and Lord Sath, for this first match. And wow, that was an impressive game here by IFHE. Um, very quick game, actually. Only 10 minutes it took them to win it. And you, what what do you think went wrong here for Celts? What what did they do wrong? Well, um, it's hard to pinpoint one thing that Celts necessarily did wrong. Uh, if I had to say something, maybe it was picking Lexington, because Lexington is actually a very easy ship to uh, snipe. And that's exactly what IFHE looked to do. They used uh, level 23 Pikachu's uh, torpedo bombers to, uh, to drop a fighter and permanently spot the Lexington at the very beginning of the game. And then Mr. Sox, North Carolina, uh, with his spotter plane, was able to reach out and devastate uh, Celts Lexington. Um, that really made it very easy for IFHE to play a more defensive game, and we saw that Celts tried to push into them uh, with the Turpets, um, and they were unsuccessful in doing so. Um, without that spotting ability, uh, it, it's pretty easy actually for IFHE to uh, trade out damage, and uh, ships that are low health can then fall off uh, from spot and allow another ship to take focus. And and they did that, and they were able to wear out Celts and then quickly recap the sea cap and, and take control of the game. Yeah, absolutely. Like I in, initially, uh, Kels was able to actually get a double cap advantage, uh, letting the points work for them. But I felt that IFHG was so good in terms of like just being in a position where they can kind of counter most of the moves and just pick the targets they want to focus down and go very strategically for like, okay, first we want to take out the CV, then we take out the radar, and then just go like step by step and making really good use also of their spotting. Um, having having ECV on, on, on the field while the enemy team doesn't have it is of course an advantage, but only if you manage to use those strengths very well. And I felt that IFAG was really, really able uh, to do this. Now, uh, what what do you think Celts could change for the next map um, for Northern Waters to be able to come back into this? Because, uh, don't forget, chat, this is a best of three. So if IFAG is able to take Northern Waters, they are automatically advancing to the next stage. So this is an all or nothing situation for Celts. Right, I think obviously Celts is, I shouldn't get caught by the CV sniping at the beginning of the game again. Um, they'll probably try to formulate something to try and counter that. Um, in addition, I think if Celts really wants to um, move forward and, and take a win off of IFHE, they need to play a more safe strategy. Um, they, in their last game, you saw they took a Turpitz and they tried to shove the AB line, which which I presume the team might attempt to do, um, but that Turpitz was virtually alone um, and without support. So the two Amalfis, uh, in conjunction with uh, the Pikachu level 23s, um, planes uh, were able to quickly chew down the turpits and and he wasn't actually able to get a lot of impact in the game um, as a result yes yes I think overall I mean this is this is an experience that as a team you just have to go through these are not like clans that have been playing you know for years and years and years but these are players that get mixed together into into these teams please keep that in mind and that's like a learning process for them right now they're going to have to come back from this and say like okay our carrier, we uh, probably get a little bit caught off guard by um, the snipe, play a little bit differently, maybe switch out some ships. I really liked IFHE's setup with um, the way they deployed the Chapayev, having the Amalfis to be able to counter the Ds very, very well, and also having the smoke to be able to kind of counter the, the potential spotting by the enemy CD. Is there anything you would like to see um, Kills maybe change up a little bit in terms of setup? In terms of setup, uh, I I wasn't 100% confident in a lot of their ship, ship choices. Um, Belfast 43 isn't a particularly strong uh, cruiser. I think something like a Chapiev or even a Cleveland would probably do better in the position they had it. Um, the Turpets, I think they would have probably been a lot better off if they took like a Vladivostok, um, a Russian battleship. It, it would have been able to survive that Amalfi spam um, a lot better than the Turpets was able to. Um, but Ultimately, I really think they need to focus on playing a, a more steady game and, and looking for opportunities as opposed to trying to force them. 
Yes, yes. In general, guys, keep in mind that this is not like a COTS, COTS final broadcast, right, with the uh, clans playing uh, on, on a super, super high level. So this is, I think, always a good opportunity to also, um, if you're curious about things, to just ask in chat and see what other people are saying. And just uh, take a look at this a very, very different tournament on Tier 8, right, where players are going to be uh, playing against each other without uh, having like a huge amount of time to prepare for all of these tournaments. Um, if you would compare this tournament to like King of the Sea, like how do how do like big clans actually prepare for a tournament like this? How do for a tournament like Verizon? Yeah, no, no. For example, Sorry. for a tournament like King of the Sea. Okay, so yeah, so uh, for King of the Sea, big clans. Um, as far as weeks before the actual King of the Sea tournament, um, the leaders of the clan will spend night upon night uh, deliberating in training room, uh, drawing up strategies, and then arguing against each other what works, what doesn't work. They'll have internal scrimmages where they pit. Um, players from their own clan against each other, maybe to try and simulate um, one cap of the map and see if their strategy works out the way they expect it to, or if there's any holes in their strategy. Um, and they'll also, of course, do scrimmages against other teams. So they'll look for other teams participating in the King of the Sea, and they'll train against them as much as they can. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one of the things that um, you as a team especially when you're newly formed, right? And you kind of want to get into being able to compete in tournaments if you don't really have a lot of experience, is the best thing you can do. Try to find other teams, match up against them, use your strategy and see what the opponent is actually doing to completely rip it apart, learn from that, adapt, and then kind of refine your strategy and have like a big toolbox available in terms of strategies because a lot of the strategies that you might have in the beginning don't survive the first contact uh, with the enemy mm -hmm. where you just have to say, oh no, okay, this didn't work out as planned. Now we have to do something different. Um, I, I really like, uh, for example, the ship banning system because it kind of forces teams, especially more experienced teams, to have more ships available and um, to be able to just switch things out in their strategy because the very experienced teams would usually have like very thick not very fixed strategies but they always try to go for the absolute best chip or for a very specific position to kind of make use of that strategy and as soon as that ship is banned there are more candidates that can fill that role but it's not going to be exactly the same so being able to kind of force teams to be a little bit more dynamic and adaptable i think is always good right for me it shows that the teams it, it really matters about skill, not just training, but also having the ability as a team to adjust on the fly what kind of ships the enemy team banned. Uh, for this tournament, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, um, the ship bans are fixed for this set of matches, right? For this game, Kelts versus IFHE. What, whatever team is going to advance to the next stage will be able to ban new ships. So it's not like a tournament ban. It's not like after each match you get to switch it, but this is now set. Yeah, um, well, the teams are still readying up in the background. Um, I saw some questions. So, for example, where are these teams playing on? Um, this is on the NA server. This is not on the EU server. All of these teams are actually coming from the North American server and playing there. This is also while the broadcast will be lasting quite a while until well, way, way past midnight, at least in Central European summertime. And now I see teams are actually in the match. Um, we're going to hand over soon. Um, do, you, do you think do you think Kelts can come back from this? Well, we'll have to see. They'll have to adjust, and uh, hopefully they don't make the same mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think Kelts um, they they they've learned their lesson, and now they just have to they just have to come back to push it to the best of three match. So um, I would say Kelts, I'll give this one to you. Um, go go and come back and chat. You can, of course, let us know in chat who do you think is going to take this one. Is it Kels or IFAG with that very, very strong showing in the first match? Um, but, you know, it's World of Warships. Things can change very, very quickly. So we'll hand over to Sea Raptor and Lord Sath. Enjoy the match. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to game two of uh, Celts versus IFHE. Uh, in this case, we have swapped team sides. So the green team, the green side is IFHE and their lineup should be very familiar to you guys. Shokaku, North Carolina, double Amalfi, Japayev, double Akizuki. The big change, in my opinion, is on the red team. This time, Celts 
choosing to bring a North Carolina, an Alabama, a Baltimore, a Belfast 43, an Otago, a Le Terrible, and an Akizuki. So they have decided to drop their carrier in favor of an additional battleship on, I believe, a larger map. Um, no, this is actually a smaller map. North is uh, 48 by 48, and Northern Waters here is 42 by 42. Oh, okay. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah. So that could actually work in their favor. The reason I was bringing up the map size is because uh, as the map shrinks, the battleship has a greater uh, influence on the battle, so to speak. Um, the, the, the speed of the carrier's planes aren't as much of, a, of an impact. So, uh, yep. cool. All right. Well, Raptor, what are you seeing uh, right off the bat for initial deployments? Anything special? Well, we're watching we're watching a basically a four three split here from the south spawn. That's Celts sending Alabama, Otago, and the Tarib over to sea. Mm -hmm. um, I like the Tarib pick, especially here on this map. That's going to give them the ability to flex that destroyer kind of where they need it. He does have to be a little careful. The Shikaku can hound him, but with a lot of the rocket changes that have come into come into being in the, of late, I don't know that he is a massive threat to that Tarib uh, in the way he once was. But I will say, Zaf, I really like the Alabama pick. I feel like that since the secondary changes to skill points at the beginning of this year, that Alabama has surpassed Massachusetts as kind of the South Dakota of choice if you're looking to take a Sodak. And uh, I, I'm excited to see what they do with this Alabama. Yeah, I, I, you keep talking about that, but I, I got to say, man, that the extra the extra ability to get the heal up quicker, the repair party consumable faster for the Massachusetts yep. can still have a huge impact on the, on the battlefield compared to in Alabama. Uh, both are really good choices, quite frankly. So it's nice to see. And then the North Carolina, of course, uh, has that slightly better Sigma, uh, which can, uh, you know, definitely reward good aim, as we saw at the previous battle. Now, one of the things you're seeing here, Zaf, is is a very particular strategy that, that uh, IFHE is deploying. They're, they've got the Amalfis hanging out north of the ACAP, okay? Mm -hmm. And they yep. look like they're basically setting up as like kind of a harassing kiting flank over there. Basically, everybody else on the team is driving hard through the B-cap, heading south. And I'm not sure that Kelts is going to be ready for this when it comes. In fact, I'm actually curious. Right. Can they? Yeah. Without this is the trick. Without the carrier, they're yep. kind of they really they really can't see this push developing. They're just now making contact with the Akazuki and the Tarib, kind of the lead element there, chain trading some shots. But it is. It's going to be interesting to see because the Aki smoke is going to is going to occlude the team moving through there. And so if Kelts isn't careful, they might find this flank kind of getting rolled up very quickly. Absolutely. Um, so they should know by now that at least one destroyer is there and at least one cruiser is there. They just don't know the extent of, of how much, uh, how many assets are coming in this direction. Like you said, because they did not bring a carrier, they're forced to basically spot by being shot at. Which, um, for Le Terrible, is, it, it can work. Yeah, well, unfortunately, this Tarib getting triple teamed by double Akizuki and Shapayev. He's trying to use the islands, but the Shokaku is keeping him lit. He's burning very nicely now. Yep. And the torpedoes, I'm sure, are going to come around for another shot. Oh, 100%, yeah. And this is, this is the value of a carrier, right? You've got the ability to isolate a target and uh, basically whittle it down, work it down to nothing. So... Will we see uh, Z go down? I don't think it's going to happen right away, but he's definitely in trouble. He's trying to dodge the torps. He does take some more cruiser fire, able to dodge the torpedoes. Got some mm. hard cover now, but mm -hmm. he is burning again. Meanwhile, well, over... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, over on the on the A cap, on the western side of the map, we see the two Amalfi set to kite away and try to slow down the play. But look at this. The North Carolina from Celts has already been turned back around. And looks like the Belfast 43 and Akizuki are also coming uh, through the mid to try to reinforce and perhaps trap uh, IFAG in position as the Baltimore is basically going to sit there and just hold the cap for the Dominion. Yeah, it feels like maybe this kind of push through the 7-8 line over here has not really materialized as quick as they might have wished. And you're, they're giving Celts the opportunity to react, right? They're bringing yes. Vipers North Carolina back across the, the G line, across the bottom of the board. And with if, if they end up with both battleships on that flank, that's going to make it almost impossible for this push to succeed, in my opinion. 
Right. One of the things about a push is, is you, if you have to go all in and you have to you have to make it go right through, you you can't really stall and slow down. Unfortunately, when uh, whichever front Akazuki smoked for the other Chapayev and and the other Akazuki, uh, they slow down, took advantage of the free shots. But as you can see, now they're farther back as a result. Indeed. Now, if I'm Kelts from the bottom spawn here in the red, I'm I'm that that Chapayev is the is the target that I'm really want to try and get eyes on. Mm -hmm. um, they they've got a lead right now, right? We're only six minutes into this game. They've got about a hundred and forty point lead because they have a cap advantage. But you know that those Akis are trying to work into this cap. There's some more smoke going up. That's going to mm -hmm. allow the Akis to kind of begin to farm involuntary souls Alabama a bit with the Shikaku chipping in some fires on the rocket with the rockets. Absolutely. Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be a race to see who can essentially kill out the battleship first. Um, you know, can the is the battle no. going to get farmed down? Oh. What do we see? Ah, like yeah, the let's are, down. The, yeah, the let's read came around the corner of this island in the middle of the board. I think they I don't think they quite knew where the North Carolina was. He came around in in full view of the North Carolina. The North Carolina absolutely was ready for him turn and took him out. He did get yep. his torpedoes off. He might be able to sneak one of those into the stern of Mr. Sock as he goes by, and they do. Yep, we just no, saw yeah, that one. replay. We just saw that replay. Definitely looked like there was a bit of surprise action there. That's what I was talking about with the race to see who can kill the battleship first. I thought right. that the late terrible was going to go in and full YOLO, but he was so low health, he really couldn't do that, unfortunately. All kinds Voluntary of focus coming down. Now. Yep, all kinds of focus fire now on Involuntary's Alabama. In fact, he's about to turn. If he overturns too much, oh, I think he's, I think he's, oh, he's going to just barely dodge his torpedo. Yes. But it's not going to matter in the end. The Aki's are going to farm him down. Oh, absolutely. Yep. We're, um, fortunately, the, a replacement battleship is just arriving. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things we are seeing, Zaf, is we're seeing the impact of the lack of radar on this flank, right? Both of their radars... Mm -hmm. I've been chilling in the A cap. They brought mm -hmm. back the battleship. I like that play. I feel like they should have brought back one of the radars after seeing what these guys were doing with the double Aki Chapai of Smoke Cloud, right? They well, did it last uh, game too. Yeah. A, a few minutes ago, I was talking about that. I had literally thought right. they were just going to plant the Baltimore there and send everybody else back to the middle, but they didn't. They just turned yeah. her back around and said, no, 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 go back back up and kill the kiting Amalfis because that's totally going to work. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're continuing to chase these Amalfis up the 2-3 line, and it's just really not going to amount to much uh, at the end of the game, right? Because the game is not going to be won on that flank now that there's been a lead change and they're down two ships. Right. Right, and then meanwhile, you've got uh, the Otago in North Carolina um, for Celts just backed into a corner, essentially, here. Uh, what can they do? Without radar on this flank to break into the Chapayev Aki smoke mess, there's really nothing they can do, in my opinion. Um, oh, look at the hero! Look at the hero play going on north of A. Look at the Akazuki coming around on the Samalfi. What are you? Why? <laughs> Why? What are you doing? You're only you're I... only down sixty points. Like you get a kill, you can still win this, but not if you get three salvoed off the board, which is exactly what's about to happen. Yep, here comes the IFH slap. Yeah, like. SAP will turn you into paste very quickly. Goodness gracious. Uh, I don't yeah. know if that's a misplay or just frustration kind of rearing its ugly head. Yeah, yeah. I've... You know, Zath, nope. I, 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 gotta, I gotta really hand it to IFHE, right? For a team, for a team that took one radar mm -hmm. and one carrier, it feels like they have absolutely controlled vision in this game, just like these guys came to this game with a plan of how they were going to make this lineup and this team arrangement work for them. Yeah. And they have executed it, I won't say flawlessly, but they've certainly executed it incredibly well. And Kelts has really just struggled to adapt and, and respond to it. Well, we just saw a moment ago uh, the, the Wargaming stream, they, they dropped uh, the view of the, of the green team. So we just looked at it from Team Red. Nice hit there. Wow. Uh, and Brutal. we just looked at it from the Celts' perspective, and Celts could not see any ship. Yeah. Any ship. <laughs> yeah. So, talk about vision, there it is. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's what it all comes down to at the end, right? Like, when you, if you can't see the enemy to shoot at them, it, it you know, <laughs> there's not much you can do. And the, between the carrier and the, the, the Chapai of Cloaked in Smoke, they've done just a brilliant job of 
ke keeping vision on the targets that they needed to see and mm -hmm. denying the opponent vision on the targets that they wanted to protect. Again, namely, in my opinion, that Chapayev and the Akazukis. Oh yeah, the Akazuki, Akazuki, Chapayev, Death Snail. Uh, these guys yeah. are doing work. Yeah. They've, they've practiced this. It's obvious they know what they're doing. I, I really did like the double battleship play. And mm -hmm. and I feel like I feel like they could have made that work really well for them. The trick was they needed to put a radar on each cap. Yes. Rather than rather than load all the radar onto one cap, onto the uh the A cap, I believe it was on the left flank, right? They needed to send a little bit of radar to each cap. If if you're gonna win by controlling caps, especially in this in in, in without a carrier, you, you need that ability to spot things and lacking it, it, it just it all fell apart for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, guys, this match is done. Game two over. Congrats to IFHE. They're going to be moving on. We'll have a look at a game three here in just a few minutes. But for now, let's send it back to the studio. Congratulations to IFHE um, making it with two matches into the next stage of the tournament. Let's bring Duke and talk about this match. Um, very, very interesting for me was actually that IFH AG didn't change their setup. They just took exactly what they had in the previous match, while Kelts shuffled around a lot of things and dropping the carry off completely. Um, what, what do you think happened there? Was it lack of confidence in the carrier providing them with um, the benefit, or was it just like a map specific thing, you think? I, I think. Kelts probably after the first game they thought, okay, how can we prevent our CV from being sniped like like happened on North, um, and they you know it's a time crunch. You've got to be able to come up with these things on the fly, which is a really difficult task. And so they decided, well, let's do a, a double ba battleship strat um, because you obviously can't CV snipe a battleship. <laughs> um, I think uh, in in terms of IFHE's play, um, the double Akazuki Chapiev is extremely strong uh, as they showed us. Um, and like Raptor and Zath said uh, during that cast, um, Kelts didn't have an answer to the the double Akazuki Chapayev, um, and the without any spotting, the double battleships weren't able to apply the pressure that they needed to. Um, and yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty much how I'd sum that up. Uh, IFHE did a, a really good job playing that map, um, and Kelts had to react, and 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 that's the harder part. If if you're forced to react, then then you're at a disadvantage from the get go. Yeah, even though even though I thought that um, Kels actually had a good chance to come back into this match because mm -hmm. they didn't lose the Leterrible um, early on. They actually like mm -hmm. they kind of threw it away, but I mean there was a bit of a surprise due to lack of vision, and that's what we talked about earlier, right? Having a CV or um, the way you position your ships, vision is very very important um, just to know what the enemy is about to do and kind of plan your steps around it. But when we take a look at how the teams deployed, um, Kelts were very, very stuck on the other side of the map, um, deploying both of their radars there and even sending the Akisuki to chase two Amalfis. Um, that's for me where if, if it would have been my team, knowing that, oh no, there's like a really big push, because we talked about this when we right. saw it live, it's like there's a very big push coming and they don't really have the, the, the firepower to be able to counter it. So they would have to kind of redeploy um, some of the forces, if not most of the forces, and just try to delay the other cap. Because for that, yes. for those two Amalfis to come back and take a cap, it would have taken at least a little bit of time. And to redeploy these forces, kind of put a stop there, might have helped them. They were actually leading with two caps, right? And you saw the points at the beginning being actually in favor of Kels and uh, for IFHE, the fight to win by kind of having to make that maneuver. Usually it's easier to defend um, the caps and then making the enemy pay for each single meter uh, coming closer to the caps or capturing the caps. But IFG seemed very much in control, just going step by step by step by step and uh, just executing their plan. So very, very well played. Um, very good to see um, how these teams have different approaches. And mm -hmm. usually I would say teams that are able to switch up their strategy and have like different lineups are always a little bit in the advantage because they're not locked into one specific setup. But maybe it was also just IFG saying, 
you know what? This setup worked very well for us in the training sessions. And right. so far, um, the enemy team was not able to break it. We'll just deploy it and uh, see what the enemy team is doing with it. And we can always fall back to maybe maybe a different strategy. And I find in this kind of event, um, it's quite similar to the Team League format. And uh, when you play in that kind of event, you you do you look for strategies that work and and synergize with your people and and if you can really find one that works like IFHE found then uh, as long as it's working there's no reason to to quit on it right um, I do want to offer kudos to Celts um, they did recognize that they needed to do a rotation and they rotated because I've got Carolina Discord up on the right which I game in the middle play and on if the left I've... it was slightly delayed because they didn't have the vision early on um, that they needed to identify that uh, Akizuki and Chuppy of push. Um, the only thing that I think could have really saved them, though, is if they also had recognized earlier and been able to rotate the Baltimore into a position that the Baltimore would have been able to influence that push. Because the the radar of the Baltimore honestly could have really turned the, the game around against IFHE with two battleships staring you down um, and a radar threat. The Chapiov really can't get that close. It would, it would be very risky. So. Yeah, I mean, it was well played by Kelts, and this is, as we said before, right, these team setups are very different to most of the competitive stuff you will see, for example, in tournaments, and it's a great learning experience for everybody. And it's great to actually be able to showcase this without trying to you know, talk down the, the performance of the teams here or kind of like say, oh, no, look, they did this. It's more about being able to take a look at the different strategies and how teams might have been able to use the resources available to them to maybe even flip it around and see which kind of areas they could have done better in because it's it that's the way in world of warships how to how to become better right you you kind of you're on your level and you need to fight against better players or against different players and see what do they do differently than you and especially as a team and then to be able to go from here and kind of improve and improve and improve and uh, just just become better <laughs> i would be really curious to see whether some of the teams that formed because of this tournament, um, just because of the way that, you know, like a tournament might be able to bond even random players together, a little bit like a clan, whether they would actually then want to play further matches or maybe clan battles together afterwards. <laughs> mm -hmm. That would be very interesting for me to, to hear as a follow-up um, from all of these teams and see, see what they do. Yeah, I, I sure hope so. It's definitely a great experience. And, uh, you know, these players come from all over the place, right? They're, they may not necessarily be active in, in tournaments before. For a lot of them, I think this is their first tournament. And being able to just jump in the water like this um, and uh, have a good time for a good cause. And uh, hopefully they're, they're able to learn quite a bit and, and uh, participate in more events in the future. Yes. I mean, as we said, the, 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 main, the main focus of this entire tournament is playing for a good cause. Uh, for a great cause, being able to donate and participate for something really cool. But of course, there are also in-game prizes um, for these players to grab. So if you're interested what these teams can actually win for themselves, so if you manage to win this tournament um, with the first place, you get 25 um, FTW camouflages, or tournament camouflages, a tier 8 premium ship container, a steel style, and extra coal. Um, for the second place team, they also get a tier eight uh, premium ship container and the coal. And then for the third place, it's going to be tier seven ships. And for the fourth place, it's going to be tier six premium ships. And um, up until from like the fifth to the 32nd place, so the, all of the participating teams of this stage, they actually get at least some camouflages and some coal on top. So it's not like it's only for the donation, but also, of course, the teams want to get um, their additional resources and additional ships uh, to, to have them in their game. And yeah, so we will look forward to all of the matches we're going to be able to see next. If Mr. Conby can bring up the schedule, we can take a look at the rest of the broadcast for today. Um, but I don't think he's paying attention right now. Um, <laughs> ah, there he is. Perfect, perfect. Oh, I get here. Oh, root, root uh, signs from Mr. Conway. Um, but I can do this because he's not on camera, so I get away with it. <laughs> so next up, we're actually going to have an interview um, with a wounded warrior, um, Bosun Wifey, um, which we're going to have actually after a short video. And then we're going to see the next matches of the round of 32. And then, as I said earlier today, we will be testing your knowledge about naval history in our trivia, courtesy of the History Channel. And then we will going will be going into the last stage of this broadcast for the day, the round of 16. This is not the end of the tournament. This is the qualification stage. And then the finals will be broadcasted on the 8th of August. 
So um, I hope this all sounds very interesting to you and you're going to stay with us here for a longer time before we now jump into the next match to give you a better understanding of what role gaming plays for veterans, for example, during deployment or even after. We've prepared a video for you with Jay Ellis, our guest from the last training session, and we'll roll this and then we'll come back with our interview. So I'll see you on the other side. Hello, and sorry, there seemed to be an audio issue with the video. Very sorry about this. For us, it actually showed this with this audio, not just video. Um, so Mr. Conway is trying to fix this um, for you in the background. Um, so just give us just give it give us a minute here. Um, it, it has to be, you know, it's a live broadcast. It always there has to be like one thing that has to go wrong on a broadcast day. But if you um, would like to contribute, to Wounded Warrior Project, a great organization with actually a lot of lot of different programs to help veterans in need. You can still donate and actually contribute. Um, you just have to follow the link that we're actually dropping in chat throughout the stream where you can help out um, if you think that this is a cause worthy of supporting or if you want to contribute to any other of the veteran-focused organizations that we're actually supporting here together with Verizon, um, you can always find their homepages right and see what they're about and pick one where you would like to do your part or for example sign up as a volunteer this is something you can of course always do if you want to contribute maybe not through money but actually for example through time now let me just check with mr conway whether we're going to play this video again maybe look let's just try again i, okay. I mean I, i'm listening to the broadcast right i was listening to the video i don't know why chat wasn't listening to the video um Let's just, we'll just try again and we'll, otherwise we'll come back and we'll see how we do. We're back.
Well, so apparently this is not working. Um, I hope I hope we will at least have sound for the other videos because it worked earlier today, which is a shame because it's a really, really cool video. So maybe we get to show it um, later in the stream because I think it really gets across very nicely um, what gaming actually means for veterans. But we have a very, very great guest to be, uh, Let's, to be here to talk about. If, if um, I may interject, look. Yeah. I'm going to try the classic hack of we'll play it in VLC media player and capture the screen. <laughs> Give me a second to set this up. It should work. Um, so bizarre. Mr. Conway, um, do you want me to keep talking, do the interview, or do we wait for the video? Um, no, no, let's, let's, we, we, I do want to show this video because it's a fantastic video and there was a lot of work put into it and I think you'll enjoy it. So let's, let's go and we'll see. Okay, let's go. Um, yeah, yeah, give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Conway, Conway enjoys this too much, having me sit here and talk to you. I, I don't, but not, it's, you know, I'm not this enjoying great, this at great, all. Quali great quality time with, with you and me. So if you have um, any questions, feel free to ask them right now um, before Mr. Okay. Conway I, pushes the play button. I, I'm ready. Oh, he's ready. He's I don't ready. know if it's going to work. We're going to try uh, again. I'll be right back. Exactly. But now, gaming has come a long way. You know, when I first started playing, we had to dial our TVs to channel three or four. Actually, I don't remember what it was, but I remember it was something for kids. And I remember our parents were always crazy that it was gonna rot our brains. But now, you know, communities of millions play together from all ages and backgrounds. Far from hurting, video games help many of us relax and find communities, even deal with real life traumas. And no group proves the positive power of gaming better than veterans. You know, this current generation of veterans, they grew up on consoles and computers, and now they're increasingly finding their childhood pastime can be a tool for improving their lives. The veteran community has always shown up for gaming. Now we all get a chance to show up for veterans. Veterans like Sergio Alfaro. My name is Sergio Nicolás Alfaro. I served in the U.S. Army as a medic from 2000 to 2004. Uh, they kept me an extra six months. I guess they couldn't get enough of me. <laughs> Sal Gonzalez, United States Marine Corps, 2003 to 2005. Jason Hill, Army veteran, 1998 to 2002. I served overseas deployments in Korea and Bosnia. My MOS was 19 kilo, and that's Abrams tanker. I was the driver. The military's motto is hurry up and wait. You get up at four o'clock in the morning, you, you get through all your inspections, you get all your gear together, and then you don't leave until eight in the morning, right? There's like a four hour gap between when you're ready and when you actually roll. We were stationed at Camp Junction City back in the day. That's what we called it. Camp Junction City was pretty close to Aramadi. It's 15 minutes west of uh, Fallujah. Still a very dangerous area. We even got cut off a couple of times because they took, uh, you know, the terrorists took back Fallujah. When you're a war, there's, you know, there's this much stuff that you got to do and there's this much of the day you have to fill. The rest of the time is spent trying not to go crazy. Gaming was one of the big ways that we were able to kind of relieve some stress and, you know, kind of pretend for a little bit that we weren't in the middle of a war, you know? I think it just helped me so much to, to, to have that reprieve, that break that was so necessary at those times. Hot take, are veterans better at gaming? Uh, the answer is we train more. So, so, so the you got your 2,000 yeah. hours. Yeah, man, you got, at your, least. You got easy, your hours. Easy, yeah. right, yeah. There are certain things that we learn in the infantry very specifically about covering and concealing, right. moving in a gunfight, that kind of thing, yeah. not standing next to things that explode right. like you like to do. Right, come on, man. Um, Don't call me out. Uh, come on. Don't, don't do that. Playing games in the service wasn't a huge thing for me. It wasn't until I was injured that that became a big part of my life. It's an escape from the reality that my life was at the time, which was pretty depressing. My standard answer when children ask me how I lost my leg is that I didn't eat my vegetables. When I finally was able to have my computer there with me, you talk about passing the day, son. 18 hours, 18 hours of hardcore leveling, that'll get you through some dark hospital days, baby. You know, I like to refer to what's called the flow state. 
If you've ever drawn, read a book, right? And an hour goes by and you're like, man, where did that hour just go, right? It's a way for you to just kind of let everything around you dissolve. Talk about uh, what it's like to come back. Honestly, I, the only thing I remember is when I first came back home, I was, I was angry, man. I was angry, I was kind of in a very hurt place. When I got so many different types of thoughts going through my head, so many different directions that my feelings and emotions that are coming up, memories of war, memories of being back there, memories of trauma. But with gaming, I'm able to actually kind of sit down and find kind of that balanced that state. Piece, yeah. yeah, you know? It allows you to kind of like hit that release valve and just kind of chill out for a little while and, and absorb yourself into something that's not so chaotic as the normal world can be. I think about like when I was a kid in the service, living on all the bases I lived on and my dad's friends who had gone out on different deployments and come back and even my dad's experience. Like, what does community mean for someone who's, who's retired from the service and comes home? Getting into the military, you, you meet people from all over the, the world with all sorts of different cultural, ethnic backgrounds. None of that stuff matters. I mean, you're literally there to bond with and fight for your brothers and sisters that you serve with, and you miss that. I mean, that's the first thing you miss when you get out of the military, right? Because right. you kind of lose that connection with these people that you bonded so closely with. Currently, I play with two other veterans. My buddy Ryan, we call him Teapot. He's missing an arm. He's got a short spout if you know what I mean. He's my brother from another mother. Together we make a full person. We play together as often as we can. Finding a community is one of the most important steps that you can take when you are getting out of the military so that you have more normalcy around what you're doing day in and day out. I've trained in martial arts. I've been in video gaming communities and they were absolutely tremendous. You know, as I get older, my back hurts, my legs hurt, I can't do jujitsu like I used to, but I can still game. I can still snipe you from across the map. As a veteran, what's the thing you're most proud of? Resilience. We train for the worst possible situations. All the chips are down and we're almost certainly gonna die, but hey, fight on as long as you can. And if I didn't have that mentality, I don't know if I'd still be here. I am most proud of the man I became the man um, that the military developed and any success that I've had in life, I really do owe to the level of discipline, loyalty, camaraderie, all of these different intangibles that I wouldn't have gotten instilled into my being without the time I did in the military. What I'm proud about with my, my service, my, my time that I gave to this country, is the fact that the people I care about didn't have to make those sacrifices that I've had to make. I see now that my service actually extends much further. I have stuff now that I perhaps I'm gonna to have to live with for the rest of my life. And to know that my family, my friends don't necessarily have to carry that burden, that makes me proud. Through its partnerships with Wounded Warrior Project and supporting programs that benefit veterans, yes. <laughs> Verizon is committed to giving more to those who give the most. Check out verizon.com slash military to see why Verizon is ranked the most military-friendly company. Great video, and now, after a little bit of struggle to get the audio to you, we now have our special guest, actually from Wound Warrior Project, Jody Farmer. Hello, Jody. How are you doing today? Hi, how are you, Chris? It's nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely great. Except for the struggle we just had with, with the technical stuff. It's, it's a very cool broadcast and a very cool tournament here. And I really like the video that we just saw because it shows the personal side of things, how it is actually for uh, veterans uh, during deployment or after, um, how gaming is actually taking um, the, the the everyday life, the struggle and so on, um, a little bit away from that and being able to, you know, give give something else to, to work with. But um, let's talk a little bit about you. How did you actually end up joining Wounded Warrior Project and uh, what are you doing now that relates to gaming? Well, I started with Wounded Warrior Project after I ruptured my spine in three places and I was in uh, Germany um, at Longstuhl Hospital and Wounded Warrior Project gave me a backpack that gave me, you know, a couple of necessities so that I didn't have to stay in hospital clothing, um, you know, some much needed pair of sneakers so I'm not having to wear those lovely thin flip flops and um, after I went to the Wounded Transition Unit and Wounded Warrior Project was one of the partners with the Wounded Transition Unit, so I got to know them a bit there, which was about 2007, 2008. Um, after I was medically retired out of the Army because of the injuries to my spinal cord, um, 
I signed up to be an alumni with Wounded Warrior Project. And for a while, it was just a couple of events here and there where I would go out to a nice dinner with my husband or we would get to go and check out, you know, the Dallas Cowboys Stadium or just a few events here and there. Um, but when COVID happened, I was just enrolled in college. I was accepted into the University of Oklahoma. And I started going back to school to get myself out of the house because of the depression, anxiety, and PTSD just was not working well for me being at home all the time. So I needed a new goal. I needed something to do. Um, six, seven weeks into the school year, because I started in January, COVID happened. So the exact excuse why I got out of the house, I was forced back into the house. And Wounded Warrior Project has a thing called The Post, where they email you every week different things they have happening and going on. And they were talking about how they were moving things online and to join a Discord. So I asked my, at the time, 18-year-old son, what in the world is Discord? Can you explain this to me? He helped me download it, and I got plugged in with Wounded Warrior Project through the Discord. Um, and once I got situated there, they started asking me if I would be willing to play some video games with them. And I never really considered myself a gamer. I was always watching my husband or my son play things like Assassin's Creed, Mass Effect, um, Battlefield Bad Company, you know, just different games like that. And they're like, well, do you have Call of Duty? Well, I had to stop and ask my husband or my son, hey, do we have Call of Duty? Um, we didn't, but we went ahead and downloaded it. And I joined Wood Warrior Project during a weekly event they would do every Monday, which we call Monday Night Mayhem, where we get playing any mode or map that you can think of in custom games and just start having fun shooting people. Well, there's a version in there called Gun Game and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm getting a, an idea of how to play the game but if you don't, if you know Call of Duty and Gun Game, how you end it is you have to throw a knife. Well, I was so new to the game, I didn't know that. And so I'm going around and I'm stabbing people with, with the last weapon I have. And they're all yelling at me in the Discord, you have to throw the knife. So it was just kind of my first, you know, instance into that. Well, I started looking forward to Mondays. Mondays became like my my rock or my anchor because you know we're in self-isolation because of covid and then they started deciding that we were going to do some tournaments and do like search and destroy 2v2s and i had another veteran say hey you know why don't we go ahead and learn this i can tell you what what it is you need to understand and started explaining to me the weapons you want to have and just how it works in cdl which is a whole different ball game when it comes to Call of Duty. And so I started playing the tournaments and the first tournament, I was an absolute disaster. The second tournament, you could see my improvement and I made it actually into the second and third bracket. Um, and then by the third tournament, I was just excited to be there. And I was told I needed to start streaming. I needed to share my story. Well, my college, had also started sending emails out that there's an esports club. <laughs> and so I figured if I want to know more about gaming, if I want to know more about streaming, they're just down the street from me. Why don't I go ahead and plug in there as well? So I applied to be part of OU Esports. Well, the director of OU Esports is also a veteran. So when he found out I was a veteran and the fact that I was plugged into Call of Duty, he let me know that they didn't have a team at the college for Call of Duty, but they wanted one. So he gave me the option to go ahead and use my leadership skills from the military to build a team. So I jumped at it. I, I went down a rabbit hole because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And it's been a whirlwind of a year since then. Um, I have, you know, two CDL teams, a Warzone team, and I'm now head coach at OU Esports for Call of Duty. So I went from not considering myself a gamer to now looking at corporate sponsorship and funding for a team so that I can help 
teach wonderful leadership skills and teamwork and how to take gaming from being an I to a team idea and allowing the next generation to learn some things that I got to share because I learned them in the military. Wow, that's a, that's a great story. So you uh, started as basically not a gamer and within a year uh, being able to kind of being fully integrated into, into gaming and uh, using that to kind of give your, your life a new purpose, right? And like a new, new direction uh, to actually work on. That's, that's fantastic. Um, you, you talked a lot about um, how you basically started this off by um, actually joining the WWP Discord and meeting people online compared to not having that community sense because you cannot meet people in person, especially with Corona, that might be very challenging. How was, how was that for you being able to kind of connect with people online compared to, you know, offline? Well, one thing I found is there's no barriers of distance. So there's some people I've made some wonderful friendships with that may be in Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Maryland, even in California. And then I can't forget to talk about my veteran friends in the UK out of London um, that actually still play with us on a weekly and monthly basis. And where before, if we weren't doing the online stuff, it was just who was around locally. So you may only get to know a couple of veterans. Now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I can log into Discord, and if I'm having a bad day, I can talk to somebody. I can see who's gaming because I can't sleep because my insomnia is just out of whack. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, be like, hey, I'm getting on Warzone. Anybody want to join me? And there'll be two or three veterans on there going, yeah, I can't sleep either. Let, let's go, you know, shoot some zombies or, you know, just, just knock out a few things and we'll talk and the great thing about gaming is it's turned into like a therapy session but it's okay if you don't say anything because you have that video game there kind of filling that empty space and it's okay if you don't talk because you get engrossed in the game and it kind of gives you those endorphins the same kind of endorphins you get if you're playing a sport um like soccer or basketball or football which a lot of us can't anymore because of our disabilities you get the same endorphins from completing a challenge through the gaming. And then on top of that, you know, a bunch of us have come together and we keep telling Wounded Warrior Project, this Discord is our generation's VFW or American Legion. That's what this Discord has turned into for us in this last year, that we know we have people we can count on. We know that there's stuff going on, and if I need to chat, there's always somebody there. It's not just during business hours anymore. It's not me setting an appointment and waiting a week. I can talk and hook up with other veterans to just have fun and forget the world for a couple of hours and just get the frustrations out by, you know, blowing up a few things or, you know, shooting people down just because that's the big part of just about any... I mean, first person shooters that most of us veterans play yeah i think i think this is something that especially during the pandemic um that is great to hear that people can find something positive during that maybe negative time uh, not just because of the pandemic but because of other personal reasons mm -hmm. that there is always somebody around that you can talk to because by now most people live online if they're not at work um, um, and even then to be able to know that there are places where you can find other people uh, there are places where you can find help you don't have to be alone you don't have to struggle on your own there's always somebody there that can help you be it as a veteran or also as just like a regular person just you know struggling with life and um, that there are many communities out there that can that can help absolutely fantastic to hear um, now if somebody would love to participate um, in Wounded Warrior your project how could they actually contribute or for, for example become part of um, the WWP discord uh, the easiest way is you can actually just go to windowwarriorproject.gg and log into the discord and they will verify if you're a veteran or if you're a support family member and then give you the proper roles within discord and to answer the question in chat I was a military police officer in the army um, I was also in the Navy as an aviation electronics technician. So I was in two branches when I served from 99 to 2010. Um, but the great thing about it is 
if you just go to, you know, you, have, you do have to spell it out, woundedwarriorproject.gg, and it pulls you right into the Discord, and then they have you send an email to their verify, and then they plug you in where you want to go from there. And there's so many different channels that you can get involved in. We have a crafting channel. We have uh, a foods channel. That way, if you want to share recipes or see what other people are doing and, and cooking, barbecuing, and you know, so that there's something there for everyone. You don't have to be a gamer to get involved in the Discord with the Wounded Warrior Project. That's great to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jody, for uh, sharing your story with us. We will now have to move on to the next stage of the tournament, but it was so nice to hear your personal story. I think it's always very different um, and, and better to actually hear from somebody in person how it impacted their personal life and how your life changed throughout such an experience than just uh, looking at a video. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a very nice Sunday evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Ah, our pleasure. Bye-bye. So before we before we move on to the next stage of the tournament, um, let's take a closer look at how the WWP Warrior Care Network helps veterans in need, and then we'll go on with the next match. So I'll see you on the other side in a minute. Mental health is a primary focus of Wounded Warrior Project programming. The need is immense, um, especially with the almost three million folks that have deployed and are coming back suffering from post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, et cetera. It was a unique opportunity really to bring uh, some of the top academic medical centers into a network of collaboration with the Wounded Warrior Project and the results are off the chart. Uh, we take folks that are significantly injured uh, when they show up on the first day and we bring them to a place in life where they're highly functional. They're able to now spend time with their families, go food shopping, for example, something that we really take for granted. But for someone who's suffering from PTSD, the fact that they can then go and do something as simple as go to the supermarket is, is really incredible. We're able to compress a year of therapy into two weeks. And that's a year of individual therapy, a year of group therapy, with a lot of add-on wraparound care. We have built this incredible network of professionals who are absolutely dedicated to our veterans, to destigmatizing issues related to trauma and mental health. They figure out what pathway is best for you. We've each taken a little bit different angle in how exactly we're doing the treatment. So with that, we're collecting a lot of information about how the veterans are doing in the program and what veterans may be responding better to one part of the program or another part of the program. Very few people come home from uh, the wars overseas unaffected, and Bill was doing a really good job of keeping it under wraps. The Warrior Care Network program taught us to not avoid our issues uh, that we live with. It was to, to face them head on but not without the tools to face them head on. It was around other veterans, so it brings back that sense of belonging. It was just so good for him, and he really did. He really did come back to life at that time period. When we have wars that are presenting with moderate to severe post-traumatic stress disorder, we're seeing um, impressive outcomes, getting them from the severe to the moderate level and moderate to minimal level post-intensive um, outpatient program. Your veteran has to be in that place where they will embrace the help that's available to him. And that is exactly what Bill's done. And that's exactly why we're doing as well as we are today. And I'm optimistic for the future, absolutely optimistic. And we're back now with the last match, actually. So the best of three, the third match here between eight and minus one S. Um, so this is going to be very interesting. We have as banned ships, Baltimore, Mines, Chapayev, and Kid Duke. Um, no CV band and only one DD band very strong here on the cruiser bands. What do you think about this? Well, um, I think some of these bands are pretty logical. Uh, getting rid of Chapiev is uh, definitely a good pick. Chapiev has, with its 12-kilometer uh, radar, is actually able to radar um, further than its base detection range, which is which is really great. Um, Mains is also a very powerful ship in uh, that the tier eight level. And then yeah, and then we have the kit as a band, and I see the teams are actually jumping into battle, so we're going to be going straight up into action in roughly 50 seconds. 
Now, both of these teams seem to be on the same level, chat, but you should still let us know who do you think is going to um, win this one. I saw some questions about whether you're able to actually see other other matches at the same time unfortunately not today um, but we um, try to cover as many games as possible uh, throughout this day and tournament so we hope to be able to bring you as many different teams as possible of course depending on who's going to advance to the next stage so since we haven't seen any of the previous matches from these teams there's not a lot of um I guess, estimation from our side who's going to win the match or not so we'll just hand this over slowly to lord seth and sea raptor i hope you're going to enjoy this match um of course we're going to be here in chat for you and with this we'll hand over to the game enjoy it <laughs> 